An avid cyclist dreams of turning his passion into a business. He consults his banker to help find the best path. Now bike wheels are being built, and all it took was a little push to get rolling. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Clint. We all love the low country lifestyle, which is why we should do our best to protect it. To get insurance that helps you protect your home from whatever the low country throws at you, contact C.T. Lowndes & Company today. Their local agents can review your coverage to help make sure you're properly protected. C.T. Lowndes & Company has been helping protect and insuring the low country since 1850. Visit ctlowndes.com to learn more and request a quote. That's C-T-L-O-W-N-D-E-S dot com. Today's show is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9... Space Nuts. Hello again and thank you for joining us on the Space Nuts podcast. This is where we talk about astronomy and we pretend to know what it's all about and we have you completely fleeced. Well, I do. Uh, Fred does know his stuff. Uh, Fred Watson joins me as always from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Hello, Fred. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? I am well. I'm very uh, well. And you, and you look fresh as a daisy, my friend. Uh, Where yeah. have you been? <laughs> uh, look, fresh as a daisy is not the way I feel, I can tell you. Um, parts of me are still uh, on a plane somewhere coming back from uh, from North Africa. So uh, I flew, uh, arrived into Sydney at midnight last night, having left uh, Aswan at four o'clock the previous day oh. four o'clock in the morning uh, so it's been a very long trip um so i've been uh, involved with one of one of the tours that the um you know that we from time to time undertake leading mm. mostly australian uh, people all, all of whom are just interested in stuff not necessarily interested in uh, in um, in astronomy uh, and that's what i've been doing maybe uh, in a minute or two we might have time to talk a bit more about that Oh, yeah, well, why not? I think that'd be fantastic. Also okay. on the agenda today, uh, the Cosmic Dawn. It looks like they've actually detected evidence of it, uh, actually the formation of the, the first stars, they think. Uh, the fate of Elon Musk's Tesla, um, which uh, is, it's just got a lot of people captivated. Actually, I, I know a bloke who's just bought himself a Tesla Roadster, mm. and as he was bringing it home, he got booked for speeding. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, so and uh, uh, he won't let me look at it, let alone drive it. And yeah. subatomic particles, uh, we've had a question about uh, subatomic part particles caught up in gravitational waves and the effect of their time, what would happen to them. Good question. We'll get to that a little later. But let's start with your, your little journey to e Egypt and Oman. Uh, what, were you, you know, what were you looking at over there, astronomically speaking, Fred? It's, um, I suppose this is astronomy in the broadest sense of the word because Oman uh, was definitely about um, planetary science. In fact, to be more specific, it was really about geology. Um, we had a geologist uh, with us. And Oman is an interesting place because uh, the Arabian Peninsula sits on its own little mini tectonic plate. Uh, so that you know that we we, we all know about uh, what happens when tectonic plates collide. There are uh, just plates um, going to what are called subduction zones. One plate goes underneath another. Sometimes mountains are raised and all that sort of thing. And they do and, have and their so, fair share of earthquakes over there, unfortunately. That, that's right, they do. Um, but um, the really interesting stuff in Oman is just the way the geology is completely in front of you. There are there are huge mountains of 
of, uh, of limestone, which are structures that um, uh, you know show all the folding and the uh, uh, and the uplift and the downlift and all the kinds of things that we know happen on Earth and make rocks look like bits of bendy plastic. Uh, we know that they happen over a lot, very long periods of time, which is why why you know I, I guess why why they have this appearance of, of uh, very smooth folding and faulting and things of that sort. But um, the other thing that is interesting in Oman is that they're uh, particularly around the area of Moscow, the capital, and we spent some time there uh, there is there are mountains which uh, are rich in uh, uh, ophiolite ophiolite which is a, a, a rock that is thought to originate uh, right at the very bottom of the earth's crust in other words that region where the earth's crust stops and the mantle starts, the mantle being the, 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 the sort of uh, semi-fluid zone beneath the Earth's crust, uh, below which is the core itself, the Earth's mm. core. So I feel like it's um, a rarity on Earth. Now, uh, now my, my um, journalistic sniffer just said Orpheolite. That sounds like some mythological reference to Orpheus in the underworld. Well, it, um, it, that's probably my mispronunciation. Oh, OK. Because, <laughs> and, and I'm sprung here because um, I... Uh, <laughs> My the, the, the last uh, formal geology I did in my education was in, in 1963. Um, I've done a lot since then, but it's been very much uh, out of personal interest rather than rather than looking at um, y you know the the, uh, the, the, the the more formal aspects of geology. But you've you've you're a you've absolutely sprung me because the way I remembered. Uh, what that rock is called is by remembering Orpheus in the underworld. <laughs> and, and I refer to earlier comments about us faking it until we make it. <laughs> <laughs> what's more, what's more, um, I suppose more impressive is that we both fake it in exactly the same way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Great minds think alike, Fred. That, that, I think actually it's the other end of the scale, but I think we definitely think alike. <laughs> so that was um, that was Oman, uh, Egypt, of course, uh, a, a different story. A, a lot of uh, what we were there for was to look at uh, what you might call archaeo astronomy or astroarchaeology. Uh, we had with us uh, an Egyptologist from Macquarie University um, uh, who uh, is very, very well uh, Egyptology because he's doing research at one of the sites that we visited. So we, we started off in Cairo and basically worked our way up the Nile, even though you're kind of going southwards, but you're, you're taking in some of the, the great archaeological and Egyptological sites of uh, of this part of the world, and they are staggering. Often, with their original paint from you know three or four thousand years ago, well preserved, uh, the pyramids are just the tip of the iceberg. Some of the temples are extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Some of the temples, um, in particular, one at um, a place called uh, Dendra, uh, has um, ha uh, has astronomical significance. So, effectively, constellations uh, depicted on on a temple roof. These constellations are not the same as the ones we think of today, although uh, astro-archaeologists or archaeoastronomers, depending on which way you want to call them, they, they actually uh, try and interpret what these, what these various patterns mean. Uh, so really um, a very, very rich and um, hugely interesting tour. We wound up, in fact... Uh, as I said, I left uh, Aswan, which is very well known for its dams, the two dams at Aswan across the Nile. But uh, something like 240 kilometers further south of that is the Abu Simbel site, which is where there are these colossal statues of Ramesses II and, and other gods um, just sitting there in the desert. They, these statues are actually moved when the, uh, when the uh, High Aswan Dam uh, project went ahead. Um, one other thing, though, and perhaps this is the, the thing that's most close to what you and I normally talk about, uh, in Egypt there is a telescope, a big telescope, uh, I, I mean big by what you might call Europe, European standards. Uh, it's not big by the Chilean standards now. Nice. It's has a mirror 1.9 meters in diameter or 74 inches. Uh, it's at a place called. Uh, uh, um, it's it, it's actually. Uh, uh, it, it, <laughs> Here, here's the jet lag kicking the in. The jet lag kicked in, and it's ridiculous because I've been there and know the place well. Um, it is called the Coti Coti. 
Kotomia, that's it. I can't get the words out. Kotomia is the name of the place where this telescope uh, is located. But what I was, and the reason why I was all the stuttering and stumbling there, was it's usually called the Helwan Telescope because it's Helwan uh, Observatory, which originally ran it, and in fact, which originally ordered the telescope. Uh, Helwan is effectively a suburb of Cairo. Um, but the Kotomia Telescope, Kotomia is about 80 kilometers away from Cairo. So it's uh, still light polluted. Uh, as, I was about as, to ask if they have the same really, problems. Yeah, they, they have actually far worse problems than we have at Siding Spring. But they have this great telescope which has been upgraded. It dates from, uh, it was opened in 1964. And the reason why it's particularly exciting for me is that it was built by the company that I started my career with, uh, Sir Howard Grubb Parsons and Company Limited. And it's a telescope that is a twin uh, of the 74-inch uh, telescope at Mount Stromlo that was burned down in 19, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, 2003, mm. the, the Mount Stromlo bushfire in 2003. So it was just a delight walking into this dome and finding a telescope that looks very, very familiar, um, partly because I, w I used to work for the company and their telescopes tended to have a particular style, uh, but also because it was so reminiscent of the, of the uh, old 74-inch at Mount Stromlo. We had a fantastic evening there hosted by some really um, uh, you know uh, vibrant and enthusiastic and very talented young uh, research students PhD students uh, who showed us around and showed off the telescope and basically had a great time uh, it was um, one of the highlights of the trip for me and, so, and let me ask you Fred when you do these trips do people recognize you are you I mean in, in the astronomical sphere do they go oh Fred Watson I know um, you. <laughs> um, a few, there's a handful of people uh, in Australia who do, but actually overseas, um, it's more the organisation that they recognise ah. because the Australian Astronomical Observatory, of course, is, uh, is Australia's national observatory. We used to be the Anglo-Australian Observatory, and they they are uh, well aware of that. And uh, actually, we also had with us David Merlin, who is the guy who basically put colour imaging into astronomy back in mm. the 1980s, a very good friend of mine. Um, David ha does have an international reputation and um, people often uh, recognise him. It's, so it's, it's, you're not the real David Mailey, are you? Uh, and who's this other guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like my career. Mm. <laughs> no, anyway. it sounds like you had a fabulous trip, though. Mm. All right. Um, thanks for telling us about it, Fred. You're listening to Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley is my name and with me, Fred Watson. Now, let's take a little break and find out more about our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. Uh, this is the one I use. I've been using it for a couple of years, and I love it. When I joined ExpressVPN, they were, they were brand new, uh, new to the market, but uh, I read a lot of reviews and did a lot of comparisons, and there was just something about their, their business model that I particularly liked and a couple of years down the track honestly can't complain their interface is very easy to use their their service is second to none uh, I've had to contact them a couple of times about um, certain things that I wanted to do and they were brilliant so you may be wondering why I do need a VPN at all it's all about privacy uh, do you really want big tech companies governments and others knowing uh, what's going on with your online activity. Even if you're having nothing to hide, it just feels downright creepy. Uh, I think you'll agree. And governments are getting more and more interested in what you're doing every day. And so, yeah, protecting your privacy is what VPN is all about. And how often do you uh, run across websites that you want to get information from only to find that they're geo-blocked? This is becoming an increasing problem, but ExpressVPN solves that problem for you. Uh, now, if you go to our special URL, you'll see quite a list of things this service can help you with, things you may never have thought of before. As I say, it's the one I use, secure, fast, and it just works. Uh, so protect yourself online today and find out more about how to get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's T-R-Y-E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Try expressvpn.com slash space to learn more 
and you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. Now, back to the show. Roger, your lives are here also. Space Nuts. Next up, Fred, The Cosmic Dawn, which sounds like the title of a great movie or perhaps some kind of um, science fiction battle. But it is, in fact, an event, and uh, we have now detected signs of the formation of the first stars in the universe. This must be quite exciting. Uh, it is, because um, the observation of the first stars in the universe is one of the holy grails of astronomy. Uh, and, of, of course, Andrew, it, um, it goes back to the fact that when we look out into space we are always looking back in time. Mm. So uh, as, as astronomers look further and further out into space, you can look further and further back in time, and you can get to a time um, when there were no stars uh, in the universe. So one of the big uh, tasks that astronomers have set themselves is to observe back to that time when the first stars were switching on. And that needs big optical or visible light telescopes, the coming generation of uh, ELTs, extremely large telescopes, will be the ones that will allow us to see these first stars directly, because of course they're in distant galaxies, they are very, very far away. But those first stars, when they did switch on, they did something to the gas uh, around them, uh, and this was basically hydrogen gas that's in uh, you know in the in the um, in the early universe the, the, after the big bang the universe was pretty well uh, once the, the the sort of blast had settled down the the, the universe was filled with cold hydrogen uh, and it was from that cold hydrogen that uh, the first stars formed so when those stars switched on they were very bright, they were energetic, they radiated copious quantities of ultraviolet radiation. And that did something to the, the, the gas in which they were immersed. In fact, it, it basically ionized it. Um, and what that means is that you can, uh, what you can do is use a relatively small radio telescope to look at, at that signature within the background gas. Uh, which is effectively time-stamped, and that's why this res research is very exciting. They, they, this is, uh, you, you know, the, the signal is time-stamped. It's done by what we call the redshift technique. Uh, 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 there's, a, the, there's basically a time imprinted on it that tells you when it originated, and that is what has now been detected. And so um, they think they found a signal that dates from about 180 million years after the Big Bang took place. Remember, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So this uh, first 180 million years is what we, we now call the Dark Ages, when there was no sh stars shining. But 180 million years after the Big Bang, we start seeing this signature that says stars are shining, and it's modified the gas. Mm. Uh, that, so that's a pretty exciting finding, especially because it was made with a fairly modest radio telescope uh, in, in Australia, the Murkison um, Wide Field Array. Oh, I've heard uh, of that, yes. Yeah, that's right, which is um, in Western Australia, a very radio quiet region of the uh, of the continent. Uh, so it's astronomers there uh, and, and working with their colleagues, um, some are, uh, for example, at Arizona State University. Um, these uh, scientists have actually made this big announcement. It was uh, it was big news a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, there is a, a, a subplot to it, though, Andrew, which in, in some ways is even more interesting because uh, you and I have talked many times before about dark matter, this stuff that we know pervades the universe. It outweighs normal matter by five to one. Uh, it's, it's wherever normal matter happens to be. We think galaxies are en uh, enclosed in cocoons of dark matter. Um, we, we know it exists because uh, without it, galaxies would fly apart as they rotate. But it doesn't seem to interact with normal matter in any other way than through gravity. It's gravity holds uh, galaxies together, but it doesn't dim them or make them shine brighter or anything like that. It doesn't do anything in relation to uh, the, the normal subatomic particles, which, by the way, we give the slightly fancy term of baryons to. Baryonic particles are normal particles. Um, dark matter particles aren't. Well, they, they are probably normal, but we don't know what they are. Um, so in our present universe, there's, as I said, no interaction uh, to speak of between dark matter and normal matter. But this signal that was detected from the background gas when the first stars switched on shows that the much colder than it was expected to be um, 
you know temperatures which are way down in the in the nearly in the nearly zeros um, and one possibility uh, for that that the this all gets looked at by theoretical astronomers but one possibility for the reason why that gas is colder than we is that actually in the early universe there was some direct interaction between hydrogen atoms and dark matter. That's one, um, you know, one possibility for why this gas is colder. It's it's not terribly intuitive, but if there's if there is an, inter an interaction between dark matter particles and hydrogen, then you get a colder temperature of this gas, and that excites scientists because. It's kind of a chink in the armor of dark matter. You know, it's showing us that maybe at some time when conditions were very different in the early universe, there was an interaction there that might allow us to interpret what dark matter is and give us an idea of what we should be looking for in the modern universe. That's a long way round of saying uh, astronomers are very excited about this. As excited as astronomers can get. <laughs> Because I I, I think, yeah, some of the greatest discoveries have gone. Oh gosh, yeah, that would be good. That's a, yeah, it's about <laughs> as exciting as, as it can. But now this, this, I mean, that, I'm just reading through some of the articles about this, and uh, yeah, they describe this this discovery as uh, a key epoch in history. It's a word you shouldn't use lightly, but um, when you do yeah. use it uh, in in this sense, it does indicate that the significance of the find. Exactly. It is a milestone, as, uh, as, as uh, other people have pointed out, too. So, yeah, I think we, we will hear more about this. And maybe, just maybe, it will lead us in the right direction for finding out exactly what dark matter is. And it's also very exciting that Western Australia actually did something. <laughs> Quite so. Mm. They've got really See, good I don't stuff. just reserve my tongue Comments lashings to New, New Zealanders. <laughs> I get it back twofold, by the way, so don't worry too much about that. Sure you do, yeah, I'm sure mm. you do. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. Space Nuts. Okay, Fred, let's hit the road and look at Elon Musk's Tesla, which is theoretically on its way to Mars, although uh, uh, it's, it's making the news again. Is, is something not right? Is something, <laughs> is something amiss with um, the Musk Tesla? Well, apparently the Musk Tesla has out-Tesla'd itself. It's, uh, it's actually going further than it should have done. Oops. So just, just to recap, uh, this was, of course, the payload for the first test of SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket, which was launched on the 8th of February this year. And um, Elon Musk's uh, Tesla provided the, the, the dummy payload. Normally, people use planks of steel or bits of concrete, things that they don't really care too much about. But... Um, Tesla, the, the, the 2008 model Tesla uh, that uh, Elon Musk has been driving, presumably for the last 10 years, found its way into the payload bay and was sent in an orbit that would intersect with the orbit of Mars. That was the idea. Uh, it wasn't going to Mars as such because that you know, de depends on all, everything just being perfectly right. What Elon did was put it in, into an orbit, a very elongated orbit that would carry it from... An Earth. elongated of course, elongated. Oh. Yes, that's right. It would right. have to be it? what we call an elliptical elongated <laughs> orbit. So that orbit um, starts off with the orbit of the Earth, but then carries the spacecraft right out to the orbit of Mars. This was the idea before returning back again and then kissing the orbit of the Earth again and then heading out to Mars in a sort of infinite cycle of the ellipses. Um, but it seems that uh, rather too much energy was given to the final stage and this uh, the object uh, which by the way now has a, a, a formal name it's called target body 143205 oh really <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just uh, dot the i's and cross the t's but it's going out to 257 million kilometers rather than the orbit of mars it's more or less halfway to jupiter uh, so firmly in the asteroid belt in yes fact, oh that uh, could be a problem uh, it might be, yeah, it might clout something on the way. Uh, the reason why this is in the news again, though, Andrew, and it's not a very big story, but it's rather a nice... Oh, it's just fascinating. A group of uh, scientists have uh, analysed what will happen to the, uh, the Tesla orbit as it, uh, as it you know, evolves uh, over time, because it's, it, it's, got, it's feeling pulls from the gravity of all the planets and un undergoes what we in the trade call perturbations. Perturbations are those gravitational tugs that you get from other worlds. So they've, these guys have looked uh, in detail at uh, the orbit of 
of uh, Elon's Tesla. And the next time it will uh, get close to Earth uh, is, is actually in 2091. Good grief. Uh, that is when it will next be in the vicinity of Earth. These are pretty early orbits because this is all going to go on for billions of years. Uh, eventually, I think there's a suggestion that it will collide with the sun. But in 2091, it will come back to be very close to Earth. And it, there is a, a vanishingly small possibility that it will actually hit the Earth, uh, but, you know, burn up in the atmosphere probably. Um, the the, uh, the writer Andrew Masterson has, uh, Masterson has written a lovely article on this, and he uh, sort of uh, paints this picture of um, somebody working in a field somewhere, and suddenly a, an 80 odd year old Tesla falls out of the sky with a mannequin dressed in a space suit in it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can imagine the conversation that would go on following that. Uh, it almost certainly won't hit the Earth, but 2091 is the next uh, nearest um, uh, apparition. I, I suspect. Suspect you and I are unlikely to talk about that at the time, mm. uh, but um, that's something to prefer the young people of today to put in their diaries. I, su I suspect what's going to happen is that we will have uh, space travel uh, as a commonality in in humanity by then. Maybe uh, so. And someone's going to go get it. Going yeah, to, somebody will go and get it. They'll retrieve what... it. I think it'll come back. That's my theory. Uh, yeah, come back in in one piece rather than in yeah, little bits. And it'll be put in a museum. Or something like that. That's what I well, reckon. Probably be analysed for you know a hundred years of space flight to see what yeah, that's done. Exactly. To it. And when you think about it, it's very very clever because it writes Elon Musk into into history. He'll, yes. he'll always yes. be remembered because of this one event. But then people will look at what else he's done and go, "Wow, this guy's amazing." Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah and it only cost him a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and some. <laughs> All right, so we will watch Elon Musk's Tesla with his interest. Uh, and, um, yeah, I don't know how he's going to pay for all the speeding tickets when it gets, when it gets back <laughs> because that could be an issue too. Quite this good. is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here, Fred Watson there. Okay, we checked all four systems and being with a go. Space Nuts. Finally, Fred, an audience question. These are coming in thick and fast. I've got a bunch of them while you're away. So we're going to try and get to them all. No promises because some of them are really hard. But uh, this one comes from Stephen in uh, Kingsport, Tennessee. Hello, Andrew and Fred. I'm an avid listener, and now you've uh, made me a critical thinker. Oh, sorry. Uh, in past episodes, Space Nuts has discussed LIGO and the evidence of gravitational waves. Also, more recently, you two have discussed the effect of gravity on time. Yes, we did. Uh, so... Suppose you were a subatomic particle that's in a gravitational wave. Would time slow down for you? Would time speed up? Or both? Ah, Stephen's on to something, is he, Fred? Uh, uh, yes, he is, actually. He's right on the, on the mark. I think it might be Stefan, in fact. So, so apologies to you, Stephen or Stefan, if we're mispronouncing your, your name. But uh, your question is a good one, because um, gravitational waves... We think of them intuitively as as waves in space. It's the it's the fabric of space that is vibrating and allowing these waves to pass through them. It's uh, of course space is very very rigid, so it's not something that, that, that there's any great flexibility to, and that's why it's taken until now to actually detect them. But uh, the thing to remember is that these are waves. In fact, they're not just waves in space; they're waves in space time. And space time is the kind of sum total of space and time, which Einstein showed were intimately related. Time is a dimension rather like space. So what you've got, if you're a subatomic particle floating around in the middle of space and a gravitational wave passes you by, you feel a disturbance in space, but you also feel a disturbance in time very, very slightly uh, as the space disturbance is. It's very tiny, but it will be there. Mm. So uh, the, the, the last part of Stefan's question is right. Would time slow down? Would time speed up or both? And it's actually both because as the gravitational passes you, uh, wave passes you by, you feel this vibration in time as well as space. So a very slight speeding up of time followed by a very slight slowing down of time followed by a very slight speeding up of time as the wave passes you and then, uh, and then fades away. 
Uh, very, very good question and interesting to think about and interesting to imagine what, you know, what it's like, what the scenario is like. Yeah, and, and it's just one of those things that we're starting to discover with the, um, you know, following on from the discovery of gravitational waves. And, and what interests me or what I find fascinating is that uh, there are so many people asking questions about gravitational waves. It's uh, sort of captured the imagination of the public. Here's something new. What does it mean for us? What does it mean for the universe? What does it mean about uh, what we've learned so far? And will it fill in any blanks? And that, that's still to be determined. But um, it probably created more blanks in knowledge, <laughs> I would <laughs> imagine. It does. But um, what, what it's done, Andrew, I mean, your, your comments are absolutely on the money. Uh, it gives us a new window on the universe. The gravitational wave detectors provide us with a new way of, of exploring the universe. It's kind of akin to the invention of radio astronomy around about the time of the Second World War. It's a very similar uh, thing. It, it, it's it's uh, full potential probably won't be realized for some years yet, but the full potential is very exciting. I mean, one of the things we might well find eventually is that we can measure the gravitational waves coming from the Big Bang itself. Mm. And that gives us a new probe into the Big Bang, which is something we simply don't have at the moment. So, yeah. Very exciting note on which to end this episode. Indeed, Fred, and thank you so much. It's been good to chat to you. And oh, thanks, Stefan. And Stefan, I'm, I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. I'm pretty hopeless with names, uh, but you know I'll get over it. But uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Keep them coming. We'd like to um, we'd like to certainly answer as many as possible. And thank you, Fred, as always. And thanks for working through your jet lag. I know it's been a bit of a tough gig today, so uh, I appreciate it. And so does everybody else. That's all right. It's time for a cup of tea now. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. All right. We'll catch you next week. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. And thank you for listening as always. Keep your cards and letters rolling in or your Facebook comments or your, your Twitter feeds, whatever, or your tweets. And we will catch you next time on the podcast known as Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes or Audio Boom and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com.